So, thank you very much, everyone. I'm, I know that uh, others have seen time travel debugging. I think I actually saw a comment posted on Visual Studio um, time travel debugging in the Discord earlier today, which I didn't actually get a chance to have a look at. But I wanted to give you just a quick introduction to what we had on the do offer. So, um, hopefully, my slides are moving along. Um, so, in terms of conventional methods of debugging that we're familiar with, I mean, we're fairly, uh, I think everyone on this call is going to be familiar with printf or cout or whatever you want to do. Um, for uh, just getting logs out. Um, often logging is inadequate by default and you have to go in and augment it and uh, instrument your code to provide extra data. And it's always going to be a step removed from the code. But it, it's you know the, the, the way that we all know and love. So we're all very familiar with it and we use it. Core dumps, you know, that's great. It can give you great information on, on the situation of the application at the point of crashing. But that's only helpful if that gives you the information of as to what went wrong. It doesn't show you how did you get there, and state can be destroyed, um, stack corruption, and that's actually going to be relevant as we'll see shortly in a demo I'll show you. And then, yeah, traditional debuggers, they can be painful. They can be uh, generally avoided, frankly, by a lot of people who I talk to and a lot of other engineers. If you can avoid breaking out a debugger, then you're going to do everything you can to do that. They can just be a distraction to operate, and ultimately, they just make your life harder. So. When it comes to debugging, the first challenge is often to reproduce the failure. And there's you know, yet another monkey user cartoon demonstrating that sometimes this can be more difficult than you'd ideally want it to be. Uh, and this is needed if you're just you know, instrumenting your code or enabling more verbose logs. If you're going to use a debugger, every time you try to um, go through something with a debugger, you're having to go through this process. So you try a hypothesis, you get to a point, um, it wasn't right, you've got to start again, you're going through this whole process again. Um, and th this can be painful, so not only do you have the distraction of having to drive your debugger, you've also got the distraction of having to reproduce the issue. And this ultimately means that you're not spending your time and your mental energy on analyzing what the bug uh, is actually doing and how your code is behaving in order to find the root cause. So time travel debugging, um, in this instance, so what is time travel debugging? Basically, what we're doing here is we're recording the application as it's running. So we get to capture the state of the application at every point, basically at every instruction. There are various ways to achieve this. I mean, GDB has a very naive approach that literally tries to record everything. Um, the, the undo UDB tool that we'll, we'll be seeing shortly um, uses a much higher performance method where we're basically looking at the ABI, looking for all of the sources of non-deterministic behavior. So this is um, stimulus coming in from the kernel, from the file system, um, anywhere from the outside world. And we capture these events so that we can then replay the behavior, replay the code with exactly the same stimulus. And typically, because computers generally are deterministic, and if you can give them exactly the same stimulus, you do get exactly the same result. But it does mean we have to interface with that ABI in order to sort of almost virtualize the, the process itself so that we can give it that same stimulus on replay. But what that allows us to do is then we can rewind. We can take the, the any point in the application and we can run forwards and backwards from this. So we no longer have that pain we saw with the debugger previously where you single step one too many times, you miss the thing you wanted to see. That's fine, we can single step backwards. Um, you can follow the path of execution through the code, so you can see how did I get here, where did I come from, which function calls. You can set watch points in the past and run backwards to them to see where did this data value come from. And I'll, there's an, another session I've got tomorrow where I'll go into a lot more detail on some of this and we can also provide more data. But just this is some of the things that become impossible uh, and available to you when you have a, a time travel debugger. So I'm going to go for a very quick look now. If I change my uh, console, hopefully this is all clear and legible for you. Um, so what I've got here is I've downloaded the free trial for our tools. So there's a 60-day free trial you can get from our website and extracted it. I've built one of the examples, and I'm just going to launch it in the debugger, which we call UDB. It's an enhanced GDB. It'll look very familiar to GDB once I start it. Um, and I'm going to do a very, very simple example called Stack Smash. So, so we've launched uh, UDB. I can run this application, and we've we've basically had a, a seg fault. Um, if I look at the backtrace, we can see our stack's not especially happy. At this point, we've got a core dump. It wouldn't be very helpful either. You've got no idea how you've got here. Data's just a bit confused. 
But we have a time travel capability. So, so I can do reverse step I, which will do a reverse step by a single instruction. So much like you can step forward by an instruction, we can go backwards. And suddenly, our stack has a little bit more information and we know where we are. We have a valid program counter. If I do a backtrace now, we know where we are. We don't know how we got here. So we've still got stack corruption. Um, this gives us an idea of what's going on. I can look at the stack. Um, if I just do uh, print out the stack pointer, basically we can see the stack is currently um, all zeroed. If we look at the disassembly, we are at a return. Now, I know we don't really want to look at this assembly. The main reason I'm doing it is because this is such a simple example. If I show you the code, it spoils the surprise. But hopefully, th th this is not too painful to look at the, this little bit of this, this assembly here. Um, what I can actually do is I can change to the 2E um, layout, and we can see a little bit more of a sort of helpful debugging interface where I can access the console and see the code that the assembly interacts with. So I did the reverse step instruction. That's how I got back from this return. So that return is where we tried to jump to zero because our stack's corrupt. Um, what I can do is I can do that again. As you're hopefully aware of GDB, there are many abbreviations for instructions, so I don't have to type reverse step I again. I can do that. I can do that again. I, if I do that again, I'm going to go into this call to memset. Now, memset's a library function. Although we can't guarantee libraries are going to be safe, that's unlikely to be the root cause of our problem, but that may be where the issue happened. So what I'll do is I'll actually do a reverse, if I can actually type properly, reverse next I. So this is going to do a reverse next. So it'll step over that call because I don't really believe that's where the problem is. And let's just have a look at that backtrace again. And suddenly, we have more information. If I have a look at the stack, which I can get to previously, our stack is now populated again. It's no longer corrupted. So that call is where the corruption happened. And if we actually look here, that is the return address. So that's the return pointer. We've been able to, by going stepping backwards slowly, we've gone from a completely corrupted, completely destroyed stack back to the point where our stack has valid data on. Um, and now, just to make it obvious what was going on, if I go to the source, it becomes very ob obvious. And this is why they want to show you the source code, because it sort of spoils the, the, the trick. But fundamentally, we are writing 0 to 100 bytes at, at pointer B, and B is only a single integer. We've overflowed. Very simple um, thing. Obviously, I had to build this with no stack protection from uh, GCC to get it. But um, we've been able to record the application as it was running. We got to the point where it failed. We saw the seg fault. And then we've been able to just go backwards in time by unwinding um, the execution, rewinding it by um, functions. Um, you know, we, we can do multiple other things. I can do a reverse finish now, and it'll come out of foo. It's, it's exactly the same way as if you do finish forward. Reverse finish just goes out of the function, one up the call stack in reverse. As I say, this was a, a very quick demo. Um, I will show um, tomorrow in the sessions I've got, and if I go back to my slides, in more detail. We have a workshop tomorrow. Um, it's basically going to start at 12.30, although I'll be on Discord for the entire two-hour session, where I will go for a, a slightly more in-depth example from the, exa uh, from the package that we get when if you download the UDB evaluation, which will allow people to follow along at home if they're interested. They can download this, and we can run for it together. Um, there are also some details on this slide if you're interested in having a look at this tooling, having a look at the documentation, or downloading a free trial. Um, and as I say, it's a 60-day trial where you would be able to reproduce what I've just done. And if you want to join in with the workshop tomorrow, I'll be able to walk you through a, an example of debugging a slightly more complicated issue, though still very much a demonstration. I think that's everything from my side. So thank you very much, Phil.